Okay, greetings everyone. Thank you for coming. So today I'm going to be continuing a series of student talks on the Chinese Zen ancestors. And today's ancestor is Zen master Pai Chong Wai Hai. Pai Chong was also known as Bai Zhang, and in Japanese, his name is Hyakujo Ikai, which may be more familiar to some of us here. And I'll refer to him here as Pai Chong, since that was the name he was known as when he was a Zen master in China. And I apologize in, in advance for mispronouncing Chinese names. I'd like to thank the Roshis for the opportunity to offer this talk. And I've had a lot of fun learning about Pai Chong. In researching this talk, I was struck by how even though he was a legendary Zen master living about 1300 years ago, which sounds pretty remote, he was as much a living, vibrant person as Shishin and Shinko Roshis are today, whom people knew and spoke with. And the places and times he lived in were just as ordinary and commonplace as our times seem to us today. Pai Chong was one of the foremost disciples of Matsu or Basso, whom we heard about from Echo in the last talk in this series. Pai Chong is known for his development of a rule of monastic guidelines specifically for Zen monks, as well as for establishing the Zen practice of Samu or manual labor as part of meditation practice, which as we will see had significant consequences for the history of Zen. And I have a picture of Pai Chong that I would like to share with you. Pai Chong lived from the year 720 to 814 CE and his original surname was Wang. He was born to a powerful aristocratic family and was well-educated as a child. He ordained as a monk when he was in his teens under the teacher Hui Zhao. His ordination name was Huai Hai, meaning ocean of heart. When he was in his twenties, he received full ordination and then found his way to the great teacher Matsu and became a disciple. As we heard about last time, Matsu had thousands of disciples and over a hundred transmitted successors. Of these thousands of disciples, Pai Chong and two others stood out foremost among them all. Pai Chong's teachings seemed to be mostly in the form of lectures, in contrast to the record of Matsu's teachings, which focus on encounters between the teacher and his students and the often forceful methods he used to facilitate their awakening. Pai Chong's own awakening experiences both were facilitated by Matsu's forceful methods, yet he seems to have carried forward the essence of Matsu's teachings in a less aggressive way. Pai Chong had two powerful awakening experiences while he was a disciple of Matsu. The first one is koan number 53, in the Blue Cliff Record, known as Wild Ducks. One day, Pai Chong accompanied Matsu on a walk. A flock of wild ducks flew past them. Matsu said, what's that? Pai Chong said, wild ducks. Matsu said, where did they go? Pai Chong said, they flew away. Matsu then twisted Pai Chong's nose so hard that he cried out. Matsu said, so you say they've flown away. Upon hearing these words, Pai Chong attained enlightenment. And here is a picture of Matsu twisting Pai Chong's nose. <laughs> and I love the benevolent expression that Matsu has on his face. Let's see if I can increase the size. And Pai Chong is just standing there so open and trusting while the master wrenches his nose. Returning to the attendance room, Pai Chong cried loudly. One of the other attendants asked Pai Chong, are you homesick? Pai Chong said, no. The attendant said, did someone curse at you? Pai Chong said, no. The attendant said, then why are you crying? Pai Chong said, Master Ma twisted my nose so hard that the pain was unbearable. The attendant said, what did you do to offend him? Pai Chong said, you go ask him. 
The attendant went to Matsu and said, what did attendant Huaihai do to offend you? He's in his room crying, please tell me. The great teacher said, he himself knows, go ask him. The attendant returned to Pai Chong's hut and said to him, the master says that you already know, so I should come here and ask you. Thereupon Pai Chong laughed out loud. The attendant said, a moment ago you were crying, so why are you laughing now? Pai Chong said, my crying a moment ago is the same as my laughing now. The attendant was bewildered by Pai Chong's behavior. The next day, Matsu went into the hall to address the monks. Just when the monks had finished assembling, Pai Chong rolled up his sitting mat. Matsu got down from his chair and Pai Chong followed him to the abbot's room. Matsu said, just now I hadn't said a word. Why did you roll up your sitting mat? Pai Chong said, yesterday the master painfully twisted my nose. Matsu said, is there anything special about yesterday that you've noticed? Pai Chong said, today my nose doesn't hurt anymore. Matsu said, then you really understand what happened yesterday. Pai Chong then bowed and went out. Pai Chong's second awakening experience involved the abbot's fly whisk, and it came about when Matsu let out an earth-shaking shout that left Pai Chong deaf for three days. It was said that after this great shout, the sound of thunder would roll, and Pai Chong was invited to teach on Tashiong Mountain, or Great Hero Mountain. The mountain where Pai Chong's temple was located was an exceptionally sheer and precipitous peak and was therefore popularly known as Pai Chong or 10,000 feet high. As was the custom, the Zen master took his teaching name from the mountain on which he taught. And so the monk Huai Hai was thenceforth, thenceforth known as Pai Chong. People thought the name suited the master's lofty and unrelenting character and style of teaching. And here are a couple examples of Pai Chong's lofty, unrelenting teachings. The spiritual light shines alone, far transcending the senses and their fields. The essential substance is exposed, real and eternal. It is not contained in written words. The nature of mind has no defilement. It is basically perfect and complete in itself. Just get rid of delusive attachments and merge with realization of thusness. And the discipline of doing is to cut off the things of the world. Just do not do anything yourself and there is no fault. This is called the discipline of non-doing. It is also called unmanifested discipline and it is also called the discipline of non-indulgence. As long as there is arousal of mind and movement of thoughts, this is called breaking the discipline. In reading Pai Chang's teachings, I was struck by the similarity to some of Hui Nang's teachings about emptiness. Here's an example from the Platform Sutra. If someone says to contemplate purity, your nature is already pure. It's because of deluded thoughts that reality is obscured. But once you are free of deluded thoughts, your original nature is pure. If you don't see that your nature is already pure and you rouse your mind to contemplate purity, you create the delusion of purity instead. Contemplating mind and contemplating purity are actually what separates deluded people from the way. Now all this was taking place during the golden age of Zen when teachers didn't have to advertise their presence on Meetup and Facebook to get the word out about their teachings. It is said that in less than a month, students gathered like clouds from all directions. It was the middle of Tang Dynasty China, which was known for great cultural advancements. These advancements included the production of vast amounts of poetry and other forms of literary art, woodblock printing, which led to widespread literacy, advances in medicine, technological advancements, including the creation of clocks, and improvements to the economy due to security on the Silk Road that increased trade with other countries. These advancements occurred largely under the rule of Emperor Zhuanzong, who ruled China for 43 years from 712 to 756 CE. Zhuanzong's grandmother, 
Wu Zetian had been China's first and only female emperor. She established Buddhism as China's nat national religion. Xuanzang ruled China during the time that Pai Chang was a monk. Although the emperor preferred Taoism, Buddhism still flourished in China at this time. Buddhism benefited from the cultural and economic advancements of the time, and monasteries had great power and wealth, providing many services, including places of lodging, gathering spaces for parties, schools for children, money lending, pawnbroking, and they could also own their own businesses. Monasteries were exempt from taxes, so they were able to amass great wealth, and many monasteries were as grand as palaces. There were 5,000 Buddhist monasteries and temples in China, and students and teachers circulated among them freely, sharing teachings and ideas. Circulation of teachings and students was so free and widespread at this time that there was not a lot to differentiate among the, different, um, among the various sects of Buddhism. There was a lot of competition for who gave the truest teachings and who had the most followers and financial support. Pai Chang felt that there should be something to differentiate Zen or Chan Buddhism from other forms of Buddhism. He developed a monastic code that was much simpler than the complicated Vinaya rules that most Buddhist monastics followed at the time. Although the written record of Pai Chang's original monastic rules did not survive to modern times, his rules became standard practice in the Zen tradition and are still in use to this day. One of the changes that Pai Chang made to differentiate Zen as its own sect of Buddhism was to establish the practice of working in the fields, or Samu, insisting that Zen monastics provide most of their own food themselves, and that the crops that they produced should be subject to the same taxes as those of lay people. At the time, Buddhist monks and nuns were not supposed to be engaged in productive labor. They depended for their livelihood entirely on alms begging. Originally, Buddhists in India were forbidden to grow their own crops because by hoeing and plowing, they might kill innocent worms and insects. As Shishin Roshi said during this last Rohatsu session, in our lineage, Samu is as important as Zazen. This is because of Pai Chang's emphasis that Zen practice is not separate from ordinary life which was somewhat of a revolutionary concept in his time. Work practice inspired humility, provided exercise, and helped keep the mind focused on the present. Thus, Zen soon came to be known for helping practitioners to develop a meditative focus in all activities of life, not just on the meditation cushion. John C. H. Wu, in The Golden Age of Zen, says, Pai Chang's insistence on manual labor had a deep spiritual significance and carried with it an intimate sense of involvement with the common lot of mankind. As a disciple of Matsu, he had taken to heart the utter non-duality of the transcendent and the imminent. To him, a one-sided attention to the transcendent world would tend to cut reality into two. His vision of reality includes the phenomenal world of causal relations as well as the world beyond." End quote. Pai Chang worked diligently alongside his monks, embodying his understanding of non-duality and involvement in the everyday tasks of life. There is a famous story that goes like this. In the everyday work of the monastery, Pai Chang always was foremost among the assembly at undertaking the tasks of the day. The monks in charge of the work were concerned about the master. They hid his tools and asked him to rest. Pai Chang said, I'm unworthy. How can I allow others to work in my behalf? He looked everywhere for his tools, but was unable to find them. He even forgot to eat while looking for his tools, and thus the phrase a day without eating, a day without working is a day without eating has become known everywhere. In the year 762, when Pai Chang was 42 years old, Emperor Zhuangzong died of illness. The emperor had fallen madly in love with the wife of one of his sons, Lady Yang. 
The ill-fated love of the emperor and Lady Yang gradually led to Xuanzang's ruin and eventually to the downfall of the harmonious Tang dynasty. During the latter half of Pai Chong's life, rebel forces overthrew the ruling house and the country was torn apart by wars. Close to 36 million people died over the span of eight years. From the year 840 to 846, so about 26 years after Pai Chong's death, Emperor Wu Zong ruled China. Wu Zong hated the Buddhist religion. It was a foreign religion, unlike Confucianism and Taoism, and the power and wealth of the monasteries rivaled that of palaces, while the monks and nuns did nothing to contribute to the economy and were exempt from taxes. In 845, Wu Zong ordered the destruction of 4,600 Buddhist monasteries and 40,000 temples. More than 400,000 Buddhist monks and nuns were forced to return to lay life and become peasants. Zen and Pure Land were the only schools of Buddhism to survive this Holocaust, although some schools that were originally from China survived in Japan, such as Tendai, Qigong, and Shingon Buddhism. Wu says, Zen survived partly because the practice doesn't depend on elegant temples, statues, and scriptures that could be destroyed, and partly because they lived primarily from their own labor and therefore were not burdens on society. Pai Chong was the one responsible for establishing this rule. Although Pai Chong most likely could not have foreseen the far-reaching effects of his integration of manual labor with spiritual practice, his teachings on intimacy with everyday life were one of the primary factors that kept Zen Buddhism alive. I'd like to share a couple more of Pai Chong's teachings that particularly stood out to me. A monk asked, how can a person gain freedom? Pai Chong said, if you attain it at this moment, then you've attained it. If you can instantly cut off the emotions of the self, the five desires and winds of attachment, the greed and covetousness, the pollution and purity, that is to say all delusive thoughts, then you'll be like the sun and the moon hanging in space, purely shining, the mind like wood and stone, thoughts spared from worldly entrapments, like a great elephant crossing a river, engulfed in the rapids but taking no missteps. Heaven and hell can't pull in such a person. When that person reads a sutra or observes a teaching, the words return to the person. The person knows that all teachings with words are only a reflection of the immediacy of self-nature and are just meant to guide you. Such teachings don't penetrate the revolving realms of existence and non-existence. Only diamond wisdom penetrates the revolving realms of existence and non-existence and thus constitutes complete independent freedom. If you don't understand in this manner and just go on chanting the Vedic scriptures, then you're just making matters worse and moreover you're slandering Buddha. This is not practice. But to be separate from all sound and form, though not abiding in the separateness and not abiding in intellectual comprehension, this is the true practice of reading and observing the teachings. One who lets the world be as it is, always acting in countless situations with clear rectitude. This is one who has truly cut off the passions. In his description of the great elephant engulfed in rapids but taking no missteps really stuck with me as a wonderful metaphor for strong practice. I keep returning to that, to that image. Once the monk Da'an asked Master Pai Chong, this student yearns to understand awakening. What is it? The master said, you are like someone searching for the ox while riding the ox. Da'an asked, how is it after understanding? The master said, it's like a person returning home riding the ox. Da'an said, I'm still not clear. How can I protect and care for it from beginning to end? The master said, it's like an ox herder holding up a staff to watch that the ox does not disturb people's seedlings. From then on, Da'an understood the meaning. And I really love that image too of, of 
guiding the ox not to disturb people's seedlings. It takes a lot of diligence to train such a big ox not to damage something so delicate. According to the lineage chart in the hall, Pai Chang had five successors. Of these, Kuishan, or Isan in Japanese, served as head cook in the monastery for many years and established the Igyo lineage. And there are many wonderful stories about Huang Po, or Obaku in Japanese. Huang Po's fierceness and drastic methods echo those of Matsu, Master Matsu and led Obaku's foremost disciple Lin Chi, or Rinzai, to develop the Rinzai school of Zen. Koan practice also began to emerge with Wang Po. When I was invited to give this talk, the only thing I knew about Pai Chang was from the second koan in the Mumonkan, Hyakujo and the Fox. To be sure I had the right person, I asked Shishin Roshi in an email. Hyakujo is the ancestor in the second koan in the Mumonkan about the Fox, is that right? It's trying to be respectful of the ancestors. And Roshi answered saying, yes, he is the guy with the fox. So I'll close with this koan since it is also a nice introduction to Obaku, who carried the practice forward after Hyakujo was gone. I'll revert to the Japanese name since that is what we use in our koan curriculum. Case number two of the Mumonkan, the guy with the fox. Whenever Master Hyakujo gave Teisho on Zen, an old man sat with the monks to listen and always withdrew when they did. One day, however, he remained behind and the master asked, who are you standing here before me? The old man replied, I am not a human being. In the past, in the time of the Kasho Buddha, I was the head of this monastery. Once a monk asked me, does an enlightened man also fall into causation or not? I replied, he does not. Because of this answer, I was made to live as a fox for 500 lives. Now I beg you, please say the turning words on my behalf and release me from the fox body. The old man then asked Hyakujo, does an enlightened man also fall into causation or not? The master said, he does not ignore causation. Hearing this, the old man was at once enlightened Making a bow to Hyakujo, he said, I have now been released from the fox body, which will be found behind the mountain. I dare to make a request of the master. Please bury it as you would a deceased monk. The master had the Eno strike the gavel and announce to the monks that there would be a funeral for a deceased monk after the midday meal. The monks wondered, saying, we are all in good health. There is no sick monk in the Nirvana hall. What is it all about? After the meal, the master led the monks to a rock behind the mountain, poked out a dead fox with his staff and cremated it. In the evening, the master ascended the rostrum in the hall and told the monks the whole story. Obaku thereupon asked, the old man failed to give the correct turning words and was made to live as a fox for 500 lives, you say. If, however, his answer had not been incorrect each time. What would he have become? The master said, come closer to me, I'll tell you. Obaku then stepped forward to Hyakujo and slapped him. The master laughed aloud, clapping his hands and said, I thought a foreigner's beard is red, but I see that it is a foreigner with a red beard. And that's all I have. I am grateful to the books that Shishin Roshi lent me on the Chinese Zen ancestors, as well as several uh, web pages that I referenced on the history of China. And um, thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions and comments.